One day, Jesus fed 4,000 people miraculously with seven loaves of bread and a handful of fish. I guess I should probably be a little more technically accurate about that. Um, one day, Jesus had 4,000 people he needed to feed. He had seven loaves of bread and a handful of fish, and he miraculously, spontaneously created out of the raw material of the seven loaves of bread and the handful of fish, enough bread and fish for the 4,000 people with seven baskets left over. That's the more accurate thing. Because if I tell you, hey, one day Jesus had 4,000 people and he had seven you know, loaves of bread and a handful of fish and he fed the people, in your head, that sounds a lot like there were just a lot of angry people because they didn't get any bread or fish. So we should probably make sure that we understand that what Jesus had was the raw materials of the small amount of food. He then spontaneously, miraculously created that and everybody got to eat. And as you might imagine, doing a miracle like that, well, that was really rather memorable. I mean, if you feed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a handful of fish, that's the sort of thing that no matter what people think about your teaching, no matter what people think about your ministry in general, no matter what side people are taking uh, between you, know, you and the religious leaders or you and anybody else, no matter what side anybody might think about, Feeding that amount of people miraculously with that tiny amount of food is a miracle that would be famous, that would, you know, everybody would just, you know, and, and remember. And because we can say that with confidence, because we know that this was famous, and we know that people talked, and we know that this was something that was very important, not just as we you know, have it written down in the Bible and we talk about it today, but we know it was important to people back when it happened. Because of that, we should probably read something that we should admit is a little bit frustrating. Here's what we read is the very next thing after the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000, as we read in the Gospel according to Mark. We read that immediately after this, this being that miracle, he being Jesus, immediately after the miracle, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. Testing him, they demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. You can probably already say where I'm going with this, but let's go there anyway. Very often, uh, we, you know, it's not news that, we, that Jesus and the Pharisees don't get along. It is not something that, that's not surprising. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Jesus was sort of an alternate um, religious concept and, and lifestyle concept. He taught a different way of looking at God, a different way of talking about the kingdom. And so I think sometimes we get it in our heads. We get the impression that... Uh, the reason that the Pharisees and Jesus don't get along, the reason the Pharisees don't like Jesus, is because he disagreed with them. Because you know, they argued with him. Because they, you know, he would say something that was different than what the Pharisees taught. And that's not exactly accurate. It's not exactly true. You see, we're coming at that. We think it's a huge issue that Jesus and the Pharisees disagreed because we're Americans and we like being right. Because we are Christians, and we definitely doubly like to be right. Because we live in a religious framework when literally every time there's any disagreement of any size, it's amazing, suddenly the Holy Spirit is telling someone to start a new church. That's the way it is for us when we look at religion. But for the Jewish faith, for, for the ancient Jewish way of looking at God, that is in no way, shape, or form how this worked. For them... Disagreements were a feature, not a bug. It was completely okay to disagree. And I don't mean just about little things uh, you know, that everybody can kind of agree to disagree on. When we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they disagreed about like, whether there was an afterlife. They disagreed about whether God intervened in the world and whether miracles were real. They disagreed about what scriptures to read. I mean, you talk about fundamental, foundational ideas about a religion, and various groups of Jewish people disagreed, and yet 
they all hung out and they all spent time together and they all worshiped together and no one said, hey, you're not a Jew because you're on that side of the argument or you're not a Jew because you're on that side of the argument. That is not the way the Jewish faith operated. Which, of course, makes us wonder why did the Pharisees dislike Jesus so much? And the answer was because Jesus was a hick. I mean, Jesus was... He was, he was from a small little town. He was from a rural area. He was not from a big city. He was not from an important part of, of the world. I mean, they, they made fun of where he was from. Jesus was poor. Jesus was blue collar. And Jesus was not educated. Jesus did not study under any fancy Jewish teachers. Uh, Jesus didn't seem to study under any Jewish teachers, really. Jesus just grew up going to the synagogue, going to the temple when he could, going to the synagogue when he could, and learning as best he could. And so you've got all these people who had this fancy education, you know, all these people who have created this, their entire little world around the way that, we under, that they understood God and, and looking at things. And here comes Jesus, an outsider, a nobody, a, a, a young guy from the sticks that, that doesn't have any education, doesn't have any uh, confirmation of what he's saying. And frankly, it didn't matter what Jesus had said. They were going to look at him and look down on him and say, you know what, we don't trust you. The arguments that come along later all stem from that. It's not that Jesus is breaking the law or condemning you know, them or contradicting them. for all those. That wouldn't have been an issue had Jesus had the right pedigree. It was the pedigree first, then the arguments. And that explains why during the argument, they ask Jesus what they ask him. They say, hey, look, nobody else will back you. Maybe heaven will. So maybe it will listen to you if you could show us what you deserve it. Give us a miracle. This is a mocking request. This is like telling a four foot two guy, yeah, we'll listen to you if you can go dunk that basketball. You know, this is, you know, that, that's the equivalent of, you know, you come to Drew and say, listen, you run a six minute mile and then we'll talk. Like, it's, it, to them, it's a patently absurd thing that everyone in the room is in on the joke where they know Jesus could never do that. Except he did, like hours before. And that's why this is frustrating. <laughs> They're mocking him and saying, give us a sign. And Jesus is like, guys, I just did. There were 4,000 people. I had seven loaves of bread. I had a handful of fish. Everybody got their fill. We had seven baskets left over. Where were you guys? It's frustrating because they're asking Jesus to do what he just did to prove himself. And it's interesting because elsewhere in the scriptures, we understand that this is, becomes a problem because they ask for a sign, but Pharisees see Jesus before miracles several times, and they don't change their minds. In fact, one of the most famous miracles that we will talk about in the sermon series that we're beginning this morning, one of the most famous miracles of Jesus, they actually, they're, they're there, they see it, and then they say, uh-oh, Jesus did this miracle. How can we make sure that nobody else hears about it? You see, the issue is not the miracle. The issue is who Jesus is. And that's frustrating. Because you'd think that if they understood miracles, 4,000 people being fed with seven fish and or seven pieces of bread and a handful of fish, you'd think they'd be changed. But they weren't. The Pharisees totally missed the point. And that's to be expected because they're Pharisees and they don't like Jesus. And they're always missing the point. It's an exercise in missing the point is the entirety of everything the Pharisees do. That's not surprising. What's maybe a little bit more surprising is if I told you that Jesus' disciples might have missed the point even worse. Now that's surprising not because the disciples saw a miracle, but because the disciples actually participated in the miracle. I mean, if you read the story of the feeding of the 4,000, the, the disciples, like, they are arranging people into groups. Like, they're the ones who are talking to Jesus about doing this. They're the ones who are there distributing food, helping this whole thing along. They weren't just there. They were part of it. But, of course, some of you think I made a mistake in what I'm saying. I know there's somebody in here who's like, Drew keeps saying 4,000. 
I thought it was 5,000. Right, it was also 5,000. <laughs> That's not the first time this miracle has happened. This was not new information for the disciples. So there's this one time when Jesus uh, feeds 4,000 people, and then there's this other time when Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And, and the disciples, by the way, were there for both of them. The disciples, by the way, participated in both of them. And not only did they participate in them, but they had some time to kill in which they were able to process this whole thing between and surrounding them. Here's why I say that. The feeding of the 5,000 was done amongst Jewish people in a Jewish region. The feeding of the 4,000 was done in a Gentile region amongst Gentile people. Those are very different places in the world. They had to travel from point A to point B. There was so much time for the 12 disciples between point A and point B to talk about what they just seen, what they just participated in. There should have been absolutely no, st no stone left unturned for them to figure out what this meant because it happened twice, it happened far apart, and they participated in both of them. And that makes this, I think, maybe one of the most frustrating passages in the entirety of the Bible. Right after Jesus has his encounter with the Pharisees, we read this again in the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus got back into the boat and left them, meaning the Pharisees. And he crossed to the other side of the lake, but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. They had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. As they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, Watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. At this, they began to argue with each other because they hadn't bought, brought any bread. Jesus knew what they were saying, so he said, Why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember anything at all? When I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread, how many baskets of leftovers did you pick up afterwards? Twelve, they said. And when I fed the 4,000 with seven loaves, how many large baskets of leftovers did you pick up? Seven, they said. Don't you understand yet? He asked them. I mean, there's a context in which this is actually hilarious. <laughs> there's a context in which this is tragic, and we need to pay attention here. You see, Jesus is not wanting to talk about bread, okay? Jesus has proven more than once he's got the bread thing under control. If you're hanging out with Jesus, at no point do you need to worry about dinner or bread, and 9,000 people can attest to that. Jesus isn't wondering about bread. He's not worried about bread. Jesus is worried about the hearts and the minds and the souls of his disciples. Jesus told them to watch out. Beware. I mean, that's strong language. To beware of what? Being like the Pharisees and Herod. Jesus was trying to get his disciples to mistrust the religious establishment, the Pharisees, and the political establishment, being Herod. He wanted them to understand that the religious establishment and the political establishment was in no way representative of God, that if they were like the religious establishment or the political establishment, then they would not be living in communion with God. What could be more important then Jesus explaining to the 12 disciples, his best friends, the people who would begin the church, what could be more important than a warning that says, don't be like politicians. Don't be like religious leaders who are in bed with politicians. What could be more important than that? And yet... <laughs> in a scene that I'm pretty sure has gone on a lot for the last 2,000 years, the disciples got distracted and missed that point. 
The distraction was because Jesus loves metaphors. <laughs> he said, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of the yeast of, the, uh, of Herod. Uh, and, and that's a phrase if you guys have ever baked bread. Uh, yeast is a very small thing. Bread is, is much bigger. Uh, he's talking about don't be even a little like the religious establishment or the political establishment. Don't even, don't compromise or be corrupted even a little bit. But because he said yeast, one of the disciples, you know it was Peter, is like, oh, he said yeast. We don't have any bread. Who was supposed to bring bread? And Andrew's like, yeah, I am pretty sure it was Thaddeus. And Thaddeus is like, dude, it was supposed to be John. And then they looked and they said, who has the bread? And now there's one piece of bread. <laughs> Judas brought the bread. Of course he did. And so now we have this whole conversation. They're arguing. And if you're Jesus, he's thinking, what? Where did I go wrong here? <laughs> Guys, I got bread under control. Let's talk about the Pharisees and Herod now. Like, I'm trying to get a real important point, and you're so distracted by your own personal selfishness and your finger pointing because you want to be better than everybody else that you're missing the whole point, which, by the way, guess what you're doing right now? You're being like the religious and political establishment, which is what I'm trying to avoid you doing. I mean, this thing's tragic, but also a little bit funny. The disciples participated in a miracle <laughs> and totally missed the point of the miracle. And we're not any better than the Pharisees. Now, I, we tell these stories. like We read the stories in the Bible, and we talk about ancient people, and I think sometimes, I think sometimes we get like in our heads like, oh, we'd be better. Like, I'd totally be better. Like, if I participated in feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000, man, I would never miss this thing. I know that if Jesus, you know, man, I would not get distracted by that when Jesus is trying to teach me not to be like Herod, you know? Like, I would, you know, we think we have the, the, the Pharisees, and we're like, how do the Pharisees, you know, continue to fight against Jesus? Why wouldn't they just want to be on Jesus' side? And so we think, like, we'd be better. And I'll let you guys think that about yourselves but I know I wouldn't be, and here's why. I once saw the most amazing trick in the world by a magician. It was 10 years ago. I was in California, and we were, you know, on this, this we're by the beach, and there's this magician who's doing this act, and he's got, like, his table, and he's got a little bag here with his stuff, and he's doing this stuff, and he starts with card tricks, and that's crazy, and, and I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm hooked immediately, and he's telling jokes, and he's just one of those guys, like, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's doing magic for tips, and that's how he's eating. So he's really putting it all in there. So he kind of gets this crowd of people, and it begins to have this, um, this, this act. And so at the very beginning of his act, he, uh, he, he asked people in the crowd for a dollar bill. And somebody said, oh, I got a dollar bill. He said, okay. And he gave them a Sharpie, and he said, hey, will you sign the dollar bill? And the guy took it, and they signed the dollar bill, and he showed everybody, hey, sign dollar bill. And then he tore it in half. And then he did his, you know, his magic something, and he put it back together, and he gave the dollar bill back, and we could all see it was the same dollar bill because they signed it, and we all clap, and it's amazing. He says, okay, does anybody have a $5 bill? He does the same thing. They sign the $5 bill, they tear it in half, and then he tears it in half again, so now it's in four pieces. Everybody's, you know, ooing and aahing. He puts it back together with magic, gives it back. Everybody's excited. He gets a $10 bill. Guy signs it, he tears it in half, tears it in half, tears it in half again. Now we've got eight pieces. And he somehow, I mean, it's crazy now. We're like, he can't put that back together. He did. He puts it all back together, and so he gives it back. Then he asks for a 20, and nobody volunteers it. But this guy next to me <laughs> volunteers his $20, his $20 bill. And the guy's next to me, okay, and it's, that's an important part of the story. So the guy's next to me, and he gives him the $20 bill. And he signs a $20 bill, and the guy does the thing. He tears it in half. He tears it in half again. tears it in half again. However many times that is. He has 16 pieces, right? Uh, well, how, I think it's four. Is that right? I'm bad at math. He does it, and he tries to put it back together, and it doesn't work. And he tries to do it again, and it doesn't work. He tries a third time, and it doesn't work. And he says, well, oh, well, you can't win them all. He, he balls it up into a ball and puts it in his bag. And he moves, on with, he moves on with the act, which is pretty funny, if not terrible magic. So, 
Like a half hour later, it was a 30 minute act, so like 25 minutes later, he gets to the end of his act. And I don't remember the last trick. I don't remember like what the point was. But it involved fruit somehow. There was a banana, there was an apple, there was, there was an orange. And so I remember at one point, like he's got this orange, right? And like he shows it to the crowd, like, you know, hey, you pass it around so everybody can see, like, it's just an orange. Like, it's not been tampered with, like, it's just, an, it's just any orange from anything at all. And so he cuts into the orange, and he reaches into the orange, and there's a $20 bill signed by the guy put back together. Yeah, I don't know who said whoa, but yeah, yeah. It was... I don't even know what it was. I still, like, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And he gives it back to the guy next to me. And so, uh, so I'm like, that's, that's the crazy thing. That's, that's the crazy thing I've ever seen. And, of course, in my head, my first thing is, oh, well, I, I know how he did it. Dude's a plant. There's two $20 bills signed exactly the same way. So I talked to the plant. The plant is from Virginia. He has his wife and children with him. He is, says he's not a plant, but more than he says he's not a plant, he has his children with him who are of an age that I promise you, they would have spilled the beans if he was a plant. And if he was a plant and his kids didn't spill the beans when I asked, that's even more amazing than the magic trick itself. I don't know how this guy did that. It was, I mean, it was just incredible. And Stephanie and I talked about that for like the rest of our vacation. That was the highlight of that trip. How did that guy do it? And I came up with five or six different things in my head, but they also seemed impossible. Like, uh, we could talk about that after church. It's just so many things, right? I saw the most amazing thing. I've never, ever, and I know if you were raised in a conservative church, you're going to really cringe when I compare Jesus' miracles to a magic trick. Just go with me. The magic trick was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And yet, I did not leave my home to follow the magician. I don't even know who the magician is. I never actually even got his name. I shook his hand and told him he was the greatest man alive, but I didn't ask his name. Like, I, like that did nothing for my life. It didn't change anything. Like, it's just a story I'm telling 10 years later in a sermon. That's it. That's all it is. The most amazing thing in my life that I've ever seen, <laughs> and it changed nothing. Which is to say this. There is a massive difference between being amazed at something and being changed by something. You can be amazed all day. You can think something's great, something's cool, something's wonderful. You can like something, but at the end of the day, that is very, very different than being changed. The miracles of Jesus, I think so often as Christians, when we read them in the Bible, I think sometimes we say, so what? And I say that because I very often in my life have said, well, so what? Like, well, okay, cool. Jesus, Jesus feeds 4,000 people. Good for them. That's cool. And you think, oh, well, that proves that he's divine. Well, we got the resurrection, okay? Like, the rest of the miracles can go away once the resurrection happens, right? So, like, I, I don't care about that at all. I don't need those miracles. So the question is, well, what's the point of the miracles? And I think a lot of times, especially, you know, if you're in a church sort of, if you're in a church like ours, um, you know, from, from kind of our, our, our branch of the larger body of Christ, we very often don't think too much about the miracles because eh, they're things that happened a long time ago. But the thing is, Christ wants us to be changed. Jesus, when he talked to his disciples, expected their hearts and minds should have been changed by the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus expected it, and when it wasn't, you can hear the disappointment. He says, you guys have ears, you guys have eyes, you guys, all these different things. Of course. Of course. You know, you guys should have had all of these things. And they didn't. The point was to be changed, and they weren't. And so for us, as Christians, we've got all these miracles in the Bible. Depending on where you look uh, from different people, you'll see people say there's 37, or there's 38, or there's 40, or whatever. Listen, there's a whole lot of miracles. There's 35, 40 miracles in the Bible. And for most of us, we just look at them and say, yeah, that was cool, okay. For the next couple of months, and here's what I want to do. I want us to look at the stories that miracles tell. 
What do the miracles actually teach us? Jesus expected that his disciples were changed by his miracles. They weren't, and it was disappointing. So for us, how can we be people who are changed? What can we learn from these stories? And since we're already here, let's start with the most famous one, which is Jesus feeding miracles. I think probably if you were to ask somebody, hey, what does Jesus do? The feeding of the 5,000 is, I mean, it's just right there. Like, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit. So what are we supposed to learn so that we're not like the Pharisees and we're not like the disciples? To answer that, we need to talk about a couple things we've already talked about and one we haven't. Okay, two things we've already talked about we have to establish up front. We've already talked about how there is not uh, one feeding miracle, but that there's two. And sometimes people who are like, you know, people who, who you know, uh, interpret the Bible, you know, they want to be very intelligent. They say, oh, I bet, I bet there was only one, and they just wrote it down twice. And, and, and that, that's really misguided. Like, I understand our, our, our desire to try to understand the Bible in a certain way, but, you know, that's, that's very misguided. Because Jesus actually mentions two of them. Um, there's two vastly different numbers. Um, not vastly different, but there's two different numbers. And Jesus mentions there's two, and there's a good reason. What separates the 5,000 and the 4,000 is location. The feeding of the 5,000 was, we've already said, amongst Jewish people. The feeding of the 4,000, as we've already said, is amongst Gentile people. As it turns out, this conflict between Jewish people and Gentile people on a religious level, on a social level, on a cultural level, on just a political level, that is at the core of the conflict within the early church. For the first century of the church, conflict between Jews and Gentiles is the heart of everything. We did a sermon series a couple years ago on the book of Romans. The whole point of the book of Romans is Paul trying to help Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians get along with each other through realizing that they're equal in the eyes of God. The book of Galatians, exactly the same thing. We have entire books in our Bible devoted to this issue. It was a big deal. For Jesus then to feed miraculously 5,000 Jewish people and 4,000 Gentile people is a message. That's a story. Jesus feeds Jews. Jesus feeds Gentiles. In other words, God blesses Jews. God blesses Gentiles. Same miracle. Only difference is how many there were. It's the same miracle. Jews and Gentiles, which teaches us that God blesses all of us, regardless of fill in the blank, skin color, gender, religion, (laughs) whatever we want to talk about, gender, sexual orientation, all the controversial stuff nobody wants to talk about. God blesses everybody. God doesn't see things the way we see them. God just sees people worthy of love who are to be blessed. There is no difference. The Jews hated the Gentiles. The Gentiles hated the Jews. And God said, I love all of you. And so anytime we get into a place where we don't like somebody, you know, for the way that they are or where they're from or how they vote or what they think about whatever issue it is, we can be sure that whenever we dislike that other person, that's a person God loves. And that's a person that God blesses just as he blesses us. So that's the first thing. We've already talked about that. Let's get that straight. The second thing is the thing that Jesus emphasized. When Jesus was talking about the miracle, it's interesting that when Jesus talked about his miracle with the 5,000 and the 4,000, that when he talked to the disciples, what they should have learned about was the leftovers. It's, It's a weird thing that that's what he brings up. Of all the things he could have brought up, he says, guys, how many leftover baskets of food did we have? Well, we had 12, we had, we had seven. You know, how many did we have? It's interesting for Jesus, that is at the core of this miracle. The core of this miracle is the leftovers, which is to say this. There was always enough for everybody. And it didn't matter how many people showed up. It could have been 9,000 together in one place. It could have been 100,000. It could have been a million. It could have been a billion. There was always going to be enough for everyone. In fact, there was always going to be more than enough for everyone. Always. That's the leftovers. Which is to say this, when God blesses people, being everyone, being all people, God's blessing is more 
than enough for whoever that is. That there is not, oh, well, I need God's blessing and something else. I need God to do something and something else. I need to know God and I need this. Our, our, <laughs> our inherent, you know, spiritual, emotional needs are met in Christ. And we look around the world, our physical needs are met in Christ. Christ is all we need. Christ is more than we need. So, so God's blessing is for everyone, and when God blesses, it's more than enough for everyone. We've already covered those things, and now we can kind of put a bow on this whole thing and, and come to rather a beautiful conclusion if we focus on one thing we haven't talked about. Let's read the very beginning of this miracle story once again for the final time in the gospel according to Mark. At the very beginning of all this, this is what we read. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. That is the motivation for the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus felt bad for people. He had compassion. He saw they had a need and said, well, I think I should probably meet that. Which is to say this. If you read about a feeding miracle in the, in the New Testament, you can find six different places. You can have four tellings of the feeding of the 5,000. This is why it's so important. Four, all four Gospels have the feeding of the 5,000. Two Gospels have the feeding of the 4,000. So you have six different times where you can read about Jesus miraculously feeding people. And sometimes those are different. This is the way the Bible works. They give different details. Like, you guys all have probably heard sermons, including from me, about the little boy feeding the 5,000. Like, he's got the box lunch. And he's like, hey, you can have this. And then it's, it, we talk, oh, be like the little boy. That preacher is super well, guys. That's, that's low-hanging fruit, super easy preaching. Be like the little boy, offer your lunch to Jesus. It's great. I've done it like three times. So, that's only in John. That's only in one. Like, of the four, like, they, they, like that. Like, that's different. Is my point. Like, the other gospel writers tell it different. But there's one thing that's the same, at least one thing that's the same in all six tellings of these stories. It is always Jesus's idea to do this. No one asks Jesus to feed them. Like none of the 4,000 of the 5,000 come to Jesus and say, hey, we're real hungry. Can we have some food? That never happens. The disciples don't come up with it. In fact, when Jesus tells the disciples, we're going to feed these people, the disciples argue with Jesus. Hey, we're going to do this. Well, we can't. Man, I just said we were gonna. That means we can but they argue with Jesus. I mean, all, all of them, they, they're over and over doing this. The miracle here was Jesus' idea and only Jesus' idea. And I think that's massive. Because we get in our heads sometimes this idea of God. That God is just out somewhere, and, and if we say the right thing, we pray the right thing, we do the right thing, we are the right people, you know, fill in the blank. We jump through the right hoops, whatever it is. We come to the conclusion that, well, if we can get it right, then maybe God will bless us. We need to go to God and ask for his blessing. I think we get that impression sometimes, mainly because very often when we pray, we ask for God's blessing. <laughs> and yet, if the story of the feeding of the 4,000 to the 5,000 is accurate, God's blessing is God's idea. They didn't have to ask for it. We don't serve a God that we need to manipulate into being kind to us. We don't serve a God that we need to, uh, you know, oh, I'll do the right thing and then, oh, it'll be okay. Like that's, we serve a God who the idea of blessing us was his. The idea of helping us, of guiding us, the idea of giving us the scriptures, the idea of being, becoming a man and living, the idea of, uh, of saving us, that's all God's idea. We don't have to feel this insecurity that says, well, we're not going to be enough or that's not going to be good enough. Hopefully we can get something right so God does something. That's not God. God is the one who looks at a crowd of people and says, well, they're out of food. I feel sorry for them. Let's bless them. And when we can understand that God's blessings are God's idea, 
that God's blessings are for absolutely everyone, and that God's blessings are more than enough for absolutely everyone, we have a picture told by these, by, by this whole, uh, this, these miracles, the disciples should have gotten. When Jesus says, beware of the way religious people are, beware of the way politicians are, they don't represent a God. They don't show a God that's for everyone. Of course they don't. They're, it's religion and politics. That's never for everyone. They don't represent a God who, who is more than enough for them. They don't represent a God whose idea it is to bless everyone with more than enough because that God is just that good. The disciples miss that, and it's important that we don't. So with that in mind, our first lesson from the stories that miracles tell is this. It is God's idea to bless the whole of humanity with far more than we need. It is God's idea to bless the whole of humanity with far more than we need. It's a really hard message because we live in a world that teaches us to be insecure. The world, we, we, I mean, we mentioned this before, I'm going to keep mentioning, the world we live in teaches us that you should not feel okay because, well, you haven't bought the thing they want you to buy. You haven't become the person they're trying to sell you on. Uh, you, should, you shouldn't feel okay about anything because, well, you haven't done the right things or anything. And religious people do the same thing. Don't feel okay about your relationship with God. Don't you know you should feel bad for all these things? Don't you know that you, you, haven't, you haven't jumped through the right hoops quite yet? But you see, as Christians following Christ, understanding the stories that miracles tell us, we should see God as greater and more expansive and far more loving than we have ever understood because it is God's idea to bless us. It is God's idea to bless everyone and it is God's idea to bless everyone with more than we could possibly need. There's no need for insecurity. At the end of the day, that is the God that we serve. That is the God that we believe in. That is the God that Christ shows us. And that is the God that we are invited to follow by his grace, in faith, each and every day. The musicians, the musicians are going to come forward. They're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation to embrace this. It's not a hoop to jump through. It's an embracing of the truth about us when we repent and are baptized. It sounds like two things. It's just one. We repent. It's our old selves saying we want things God's way. And in baptism, it's our old selves being uh, born again. We go down in the water. It's like a burial. We get out of the water. It's like a new birth. If you've never made that decision, we've got a nice warm baptistry. All sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If you're already an immersed believer in Christ, you're looking for a perfect church home, that's not it. We do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. And we want to recognize a God whose idea it is to save us, to bless us, to love us. And so we never need to be insecure because we know our security rests in him. As we stand and as we sing.